Good evening, everybody, and I'm very happy to welcome Nancy Horton, who's coming from Canada. So I think she, you've got the longest trip to the seminar this time, so you won this prize at least. To start <laughs> okay. with. And um, I'm very happy that you took the way and are now presenting us some of your research work you've, you've done. Um, Inzvi Horten has done her PhD and finished her PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at Yale University in 2012. And after that, she was a visiting research fellow, affiliate, affiliate researcher, on the one hand, at the Graduate School Distant Worlds in, in Munich for a couple of months, and then in at the Venice International University, where there is an advanced seminar in the humanities, where she was to 13 to 14 as well. Now she has a, so to say, non-academic position, if that's correct, because she's executive director of the Community Foundation of Newfoundland and Labrador in Canada. But still, she continues her work and her approaches and her research on Eastern <coughs> languages, so there's some new after the a DPhil uh, dissertation project, and that's the topic today. In, in her dissertation, um, which was called Catching the Eye of the Gods, the Gaze in Mesopotamian Literature, she had a very close look um, from a philological perspective on the Sumerian Akkadian, and especially on specific works which deal with vision, with seeing, with sight, with gaze, and was looking how that differs in the usage of that languages and these words in these languages um, differ and what we can deduce from the understanding, especially in this sense uh, in relation to the gods of these cultures. Um, and <coughs> conducting from her title, Hacking Sumerian, a database approach to the analysis of ancient languages, so that's a um, continuation and maybe new ideas on how to properly deal with ancient languages and complex and not easy languages like Latin and Greek, but uh, Sumerian and, and Akkadian and other Near East languages, how we can deal with them and use databases, database technology <coughs> to understand that and, and to, to analyze it. So before you start, just a usual announcement, the structures as usual. We'll have the talk by um, Mrs. Hawthorne. Then we have <coughs> a discussion, which is as well being recorded. And then we have an uh, informal talk and some drinks and levels in the room next one. So here's to you. OK, so thank you so much for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to be here today. I'm delighted to be here to speak with all of you um, about this topic. Let me just bring up my presentation and get that started here. Ha ha ha, now we'll see how good my German is. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Great. So I actually began my studies as a classicist when I was an undergraduate student, and I specialized in Greek philology. Uh, one of my professors suggested to me that if I was interested in doing frontier language work, I should consider going into ancient Near Eastern studies, because some of the languages in the ancient Near East are so poorly understood uh, that it's a good area for people who are interested in working with obscure languages and. Uh, very working closely with grammar, vocabulary, and trying to figure out what exactly this, these less understood languages mean. Um, the world's oldest written dialects really test the limits of our imaginations. Uh, the study of some ancient languages is hampered by the fact that we have limited primary sources or a lack of bilingual evidence. And in these cases, the scholar is left with few strategies for decipherment. But even when primary texts are more plentiful, um, early written languages pose some particular challenges to the modern scholar. So for example, ancient Near Eastern languages, Sumerian and Elamite, are both isolates. Um, they're unrelated to any other known written languages. So we have no comparative evidence from cognate languages that we can use to help us better understand how those languages function, um, how their grammar, semantics, and phonology actually worked. 
So this talk will address some methods for using databases and related technologies to analyze and uncover new features of ancient languages. Um, databases allow scholars to search for patterns across much larger bodies of information than is feasible using traditional methods. So rather than being at odds with literary and linguistic research, data mining and database approaches allow for new observations that can be missed when you're dealing with smaller samples of information. Database-oriented research is becoming more common in the study of languages, both ancient and modern, and the proliferation of online text corpora like um, the Perseus Digital Library in Classics or the Electronic Text Corpus of Sumerian Literature for the study of the ancient Near East allows for more comprehensive studies of ancient languages than ever before. It makes it easier um, to search for vocabulary instances and so forth. So what I'm going to do today is speak generally about database technology and give you some, um, an introduction to those technologies and how they function. And then using my work as a case study, I'll offer a methodology for database-driven lexical analysis. Um, so my methodology is also adaptable to the study of other ancient languages. Um, now when you're looking at Sumerian, which is the language that I work with, uh, you do have a variety of bilingual documents, including royal inscriptions and lexical lists that pair Sumerian texts with Akkadian texts. Now, Akkadian is a Semitic language that's related to Arabic and Hebrew, um, so we do have cognates to draw on when we're working with Akkadian, and it's more fully understood. So we can use those bilingual texts to help us in our understanding of Sumerian, but there are still many grammatical and semantic features of Sumerian that are not very well understood. Our understanding of the language is still incomplete. So the research I'll be presenting this evening is an analysis of the word field of vision in Sumerian literature. It's based on more than 700 instances of vision verbs that were collected from the Sumerian literary corpus. Um, it's a process that I started in my dissertation and have continued to develop since then. Each vocabulary instance was tagged with a number of different features. So it's grammatical features, it's morphological features, context, and I'll describe all that in more detail uh, later in the presentation. Um, by sorting the vocabulary instances according to these features, um, you can learn characteristics of each verb's um, usage that had previously been overlooked. So this has led to improved definitions for many of the verbs that I examined, and also it helped to uncover ideological and theological principles that govern their use. So to begin with, I'd like to talk about um, the available personal database technologies and their functionalities. So starting with the general question, what is a database? So a database is essentially a collection of information that's organized in such a way that it can easily be retrieved, managed, and updated. And more specifically, what is a relational database? That's what I'll be talking about in more detail. Um, for corpus-based linguistic analysis, relational databases are the type that are um, most useful to us. This is a kind of database that's structured in such a way that it can recognize relationships between stored pieces of information. Uh, relational databases present information as a table or as a set of tables. The columns define categories of data, and these columns can be called attributes or fields. And each row gives one data instance for the categories defined in the columns. In other words, each row gives one set of information pertaining to a particular item. These are called records or tuples. The entire table uh, which is a set of records that share the same attributes, is called a relation. <coughs> Each table or relation normally represents one type of entity. So in my case, the type of entity that I'm studying and inputting into my database's tables is vocabulary instances. Relational databases are useful in part because they're very easy to expand. A new attribute or record can be added after the creation of the original database without requiring that you go in and modify all your existing entries. Now, a relational database management system is the name for a software system that is used to create and maintain relational databases. Um, I've given just a few examples of some of the relational database management systems that are commercially available. Um, there are many more than these, but these are some of the most popular. Um, almost all of them are based on uh, SQL, structured query language, uh, and use that language for managing information in the database. 
Um, so all of them have similar basic functionality, but I just want to look at a few to give you some ideas of what you should be thinking about if you were going into this type of work um, and thinking about what you would want in the software that you're choosing. So FileMaker, for example, which is one popular um, technology, is compatible with both Windows um, and Mac. Um, Microsoft Access is compatible with Windows only, but it has the benefit of um, being integrated with all of the other software in the Microsoft Office suite. MySQL is compatible across platforms. So for instance, it works on both Windows and Mac. It also works on Linux, Solaris, and other um, operating systems if you use an alternative system. FileMaker is known for having a very uh, user-friendly graphical interface that allows the user to interact with the software using icons and visual indicators as opposed to text-based interfaces and typed commands, which makes it easier to learn how to use. Um, so in the case of FileMaker, it has point and click and drag and drop functionalities that make it easier for the beginner. Um, as I said with Microsoft Access, one of its benefits is that it integrates with the rest of Microsoft Office Suite. It has a similar user interface to other Microsoft Office programs with the ribbon at the top of the screen, so that would be familiar to people who already use Microsoft Office. And you can paste an Excel spreadsheet right into Access. So this type of integration is one thing um, that would be a benefit of using Microsoft Access. MySQL has, in some ways, a steeper learning curve and is more challenging uh, for beginners than some of the other software that's available. But it is an open source program, and it has some extra functionality. So for instance, it can do partitioning, where you can divide a large table into smaller parts and then run queries more quickly, because they're not dealing with as large an amount of information. They're only scanning a smaller part of um, the data set. So, I um, reviewed that just because um, some considerations to keep in mind when choosing a database are things like cost, so how if you are paying for it yourself rather than having institutional access. Um, MySQL Community Edition is free, open source. Compatibility, will it work with the system that you're currently using and with the systems of other individuals that you may wish to share it with? Difficulty, what's your current level of proficiency and comfort in working with relational databases? And what are your future plans for the database? Um, so databases created with different software are not always compatible with each other. And if you're planning over time to upgrade your database and make it more complex, you may want to start with a software that will allow you to do that in the future so that you don't have to change it over to another more sophisticated system. I also wanted to compare databases and spreadsheets. So examples of spreadsheet software would be Microsoft Excel or Numbers if you use Mac. Um, and both spreadsheets and databases are used to manage and manipulate sets of data. So they have some similar functions. They're both made up of tables that contain data entries. Um, but the fundamental difference is that databases are for storing data and spreadsheets are for analyzing it. So you can use a spreadsheet program to store and organize small amounts of data. But the larger the data set, the more challenging this becomes to handle in a spreadsheet format. Um, databases, on the other hand, allow for the storage of large amounts of data and for the storage of complex data sets. They can also easily link related pieces of data together. So you can use a database to file types of data that have some relationship to each other, but that you couldn't easily imagine putting in a single spreadsheet in spreadsheet software. Um, spreadsheets, on the other hand, have the benefit of generally being simpler to use than databases. So they're more accessible to users who um, don't have a great deal of technical knowledge. They're also geared towards calculations, statistical comparisons, and towards generating shareable visual representations of data like charts and graphs. So spreadsheets shine in those functions. When you're deciding which of them um, to use, you should ask yourself, how strong are your technological skills? So databases require um, a higher set of technological skills. How much data will you be working with? Is it so much that it wouldn't be manageable in a spreadsheet? Would you have to keep scrolling to see all your information? If so, databases might be a better choice. How complex is your data? Spreadsheets are best for recording lots of the same type of data, and databases are better for managing sets of information that are related to each other but might not be identical. So if you need many spreadsheets to record your data, a database is probably a better choice. 
will the same information be repeated in different records? So if you have the same piece of information stored in several different places, a database can automatically update all of that in one go. Whereas with a spreadsheet, you'd have to go in and update all of your different entries manually, which um, increases the likelihood of user error. So that's something to consider. And lastly, how many users will be accessing and updating your data? So desktop spreadsheet software only allows for one user at a time. Um, even cloud-based spreadsheets only allow for a small number of simultaneous users. Databases are a better solution if several people are going to be working on the same data set. They're designed to preserve data so that information isn't lost if more than one person is working in the system at the same time, which is an important feature. Um, and lastly, do you need to generate um, charts and graphs or do statistical analysis? Spreadsheets are intended for that type of data analysis and for creating visual representations of data like charts and graphs. Now, in the end, a best solution, if you're dealing with a large data set, may be to use both. It might be to use the database for managing your data and the spreadsheet for analyzing it, which is what I do. So how do you build your database set? Um, for more, for corpus-based linguistic analysis, more and more corpora are published online. To give some examples of the resources that we have available electronically for the study of the ancient Near East, um, there is the Cuneiform Digital Library Initiative, which is a collaboration between the Ma uh, Max Planck Institute, Oxford, and the University of California. Um, this aims to be a catalog and image database of the entire cuneiform corpus. So they post the details, photographs, and transliterations of cuneiform inscriptions from collections all over the world, like the British Museum, the Louvre, the Oriental Institute, the Iraq Museum, and so forth. So to date, they've cataloged nearly um, 300,000 artifacts. And this includes a wide variety of different genres, like letters, literature, um, legal and administrative texts, and royal inscriptions. The database of Neo-Sumerian texts, or um, BDTNS, which is this acronym in Spanish, um, is a project of two institutes in Madrid, and it's a searchable electronic corpus of Neo-Sumerian administrative tablets that are dated to the 21st century BC. It contains almost 100,000 texts and has published details, transliterations, photocopies, um, sorry, hand copies, and photographs. The electronic text corpus of Sumerian literature, which is something that um, I used a great deal in my research, is a project of um, Oxford University. And this has transliterations, but also translations of more than 350 Sumerian literary compositions. It also includes linguistic annotation um, and links to glossary entries. Um, so it's very useful for doing analysis. Um, and light, both the CDLI and the um, ETCSL allow you to go in and search for vocabulary terms. You can search for lemmas and see what text they pop up in. So that makes them very useful for vocabulary research. Um, there's Etana, Electronic Tools and Ancient Near Eastern Archives. This is a collaboration between 10 different institutions. And it has a component called core text that's a selection of um, ancient Near Eastern texts that are targeted for teaching and research. Um, those are mostly based on public domain uh, editions of texts. And it also has e-tact, which is translations of Akkadian materials that are intended for, both for scholars and for the general public. Um, it's built largely from, uh, that portion of the website is built largely from contributions from scholars. And there's also the open, richly annotated cuneiform corpus, which is housed at the University of Pennsylvania. This is an international cooperation uh, that provides support for the creation of online editions of cuneiform text and educational portal websites about cuneiform culture. This actually comes out of the Cuneiform Digital Library Initiative. So it complements CDLI's archival role. CDLI is archiving uh, various tablets, and the open, richly annotated cuneiform corpus is providing transliterations, translations, and editions of tablets that are in um, the CDLI. So within ORAC, you have um, projects like the Cuneiform Commentaries Project, um, the Electronic Text Corpus of Sumerian Royal Inscriptions, the Royal Inscriptions of the Neo-Assyrian Period, State Archives of Assyria Online. So there's a whole wealth of material provided in that resource. 
Um, now, print sources remain fundamental to the study of cuneiform. There are still some um, types of texts where editions are only available in print format, for instance, Akkadian literature, some royal inscriptions, some letters. Um, you can only fully do uh, research projects by also continuing to use print sources and uh, scan them manually for vocabulary instances, which is um, another way of obtaining information to build in your data set, but a slightly slower process than when you're using online text corpora. So to speak a little bit about how I use these technologies to research Sumerian language, um, I'm going to use my research as a case study for how you can use uh, databases for corpus-based lingu uh, linguistic analysis. I looked at the world, word field of vision in the Sumerian literary corpus. Um, for the purposes of my investigation, I defined Sumerian literary corpus as the text included in the electronic text corpus of Sumerian literature, so one of the online resources, uh, the Wisdom of Ancient Sumer, which is a collection of wisdom literature, literature um, that was published by Alstair, and uh, the Royal Inscriptions of Mesopotamia, early periods volumes. Um, as well as an extra text, A Doba A, which was published by Kramer. Um, so although when you're defining a corpus, it necessarily results in some omissions, the way that I define mine, I think, gives a, a broad enough a variety of texts and a large enough corpus to start with that you can make good deductions from it about how verbs are used in Sumerian literature. I chose to classify royal inscriptions as literary texts for a few reasons. One is that they share features with texts that are commonly included in that category. They have a similar vocabulary and a sort of heightened, elevated literary style. And they discuss subject matter that's similar to that which is discussed in literary texts, specifically the actions of kings and their interactions with the gods. They're also composed with a view to posterity, so both royal inscriptions and other types of literature are intended to be read for future generations. They're intended to last over the long term. So these are some features of royal inscriptions that I think make them useful for studying um, literary usage of verbs and other types of vocabulary. So when I'm talking about the Sumerian literary corpus, this is the body of text that I am talking about. So from this corpus, I collected 712 individual instances of um, Sumerian vision verbs, um, and that included both online and print sources. Um, the Sumerian has a very elaborate lexicon for vision with a whopping 28 vision verbs. This is actually similar to the English language, which has 27 verbs of vision or so. And English has a very large uh, vocabulary. Um, there are 600,000 words in um, the Oxford English Dictionary. So you can see that a language like Sumerian also had a very sophisticated and complex vocabulary for expressing visual activity. You can see that Sumerian verbs are compounds. Um, the first word in each of these compounds is a noun, and the second word is the verbal root. Uh, the noun igi means I, so all of these verbs essentially mean that you're doing something with the I. Um, and that's why you have igi occurring in almost all of these instances, except for one, usik stug for, which is right at the end. Um, the, the nominal element usik means admiration, but it's actually made out of the sign for I, igi, um, plus another sign, um, a2, and with the verbal element dug for to speak. But um, what's complicated about vision verbs is even if we understand the meaning of the second part of the word, because those are all verbs that are also used on their own um, in literary context, that doesn't necessarily tell us the meaning of the compound, igi plus the verbal root. So as an example, the first verb, verb on this list, igi bar, um, it means to cut open or split the eye. So that doesn't tell you a whole lot if you're just looking at the literal meaning of the verb, what is actually being intended. So what type of visual activity does that, does that really refer to? Uh, it's not giving you a lot of information. So that's why it's necessary to study these um, compound verbs in more depth on their own to try to suss out what exactly the meanings for each of them are. Um, now, not all of these verbs occur in large numbers. 
So eight of them have um, 10 or fewer instances, and 12 of them are hapaxes that occur only once in the corpus. And the hapaxes um, we understand as verbs of vision either by analogy because they're compounds with Iggy and that suggests that they relate to vision, um, or because we have other evidence from outside the literary corpus. So maybe evidence in a lexical list where the translation in Akkadian is given as a word that we know has something to do with vision. So that's why those are included in this list even though we only have one instance which isn't a whole lot to go on. So, when selecting attributes um, to populate the database with these vocabulary instances, it's important to choose attributes carefully. Um, it can be difficult to change attribute names in a database later. That can um, break some formulas. So when you're planning a database study, it's important upfront to have a very good idea of what attributes you want to use. It's easier to add new things later than to um, change what you've already done. Um, so for my study, because it was a linguistic study using the literary corpus, I chose to use as attributes a combination of grammatical and contextual features. So first, the historical context of uh, the vocabulary instances. What period was it written in, um, if it was a royal inscription, or if we know um, in what reign it was written, what was... Um, the, under what king was it written? The fine spots, so if we have the provenience, well, the location where it was found. I tagged grammatical features, so in Sumerian, um, this includes prefixes at the beginning of the verbal chain and infixes, which occur in the middle of the verbal chain, and I'll talk about that in a little more detail in a moment. Um, and finally, the literary context, so for instance, what is the subject of the verb? What is the object of the verb? And also, what occurred before the verb and what occurred after the verb? So what were the prior and subsequent actions in the sentence? So to give you uh, an example of how this works, um, let's start with this uh, instance. Sisara igizid munshibar namdug minintar. She looks on the just with a steadfast eye. She ordains a good fate for them. So this was collected from the electronic text corpus of Sumerian literature. The verb form is here. The verb is igi bar, um, to look. Um, igi bar is the most common verb in Sumerian literature. In the corpus that I looked at, there were 179 instances of the verb, so that gives us a lot to go on. Uh, the historical context of this particular instance, um, it was written during the reign of Idin Dagon, um, it's from a text called Idin Dagon A, uh, or Inanna and Idin Dagon. He was the third king of the first dynasty of Isin, so approximately um, 1975 to 1954 BCE. Um, and this is Shir uh, Namursanga Royal Hymn uh, that talks about the romantic relationship between the goddess Inanna and the king, which was used as a metaphor in, um, in Sumerian texts for the king's divine favor. So this erotic relationship represented his legitimacy as a ruler because he shares this close relationship with the goddess. So this places it in the Old Babylonian period, which is from approximately 2000 to 1600 BCE. The um, ETCSL version is a composite text from 14 different manuscripts, most of which were discovered at Nippur. Um, so Nippur was a center for scribal education in the old Babylonian period, and as a result, we have many texts originating from there that were used at scribal schools um, in the process of scribal training. Next, the grammatical features of um, the sentence include the prefix, which in this case is mu. So the prefix um, gives the voice of the verb. Um, this is according to... Christopher Wood's study of the purpose of prefix, and he argues that they're a system of voice in Sumerian. And specifically, he argues that mu, in this case, is the marked active voice. So it's emphasizing the fact that the verb has an action on an object and affects the object in some important way. There's also the infix here, and she, which is the third person singular terminative infix. Um, 
Sumerian has a system of directional uh, dimensional infixes. So the terminative that we're seeing here is indicating um, a movement towards something. In theory, this is what the um, terminative indicates. And finally, the literary context. The agent of the sentence, although she's unmarked here, is the goddess Inanna. Sumerian is an ergative absolutive language, which makes its grammar different than um, nominative accusative languages that you may be more familiar with. Um, but essentially, um, the ergative marks the agent of a transitive verb. So here, Inanna, outside of the sentence, is in the ergative, and she's the agent of the verb igibar. The indirect object of the sentence is um, sisa, just people or a person who is just. And on this noun, this noun is um, resumes the terminative infix in the verb. So igibar to look, and she the terminative infix is indicating that we're looking towards something, and the thing we're looking towards is the just person which is marked by the date of suffix instead of the terminative because it's a person class noun. So you wouldn't normally put a terminative um, suffix on a person class noun. But this is the relationship between the object of the sentence and um, the verb itself. And I also kept track of the nominal extension on the um, nominal element igi. So this is essentially a description of um, the I and how the action is being done. In this case, the nominal element is zid, meaning steadfast. So it means that she looks on the just person with a steadfast eye. If we wanted to translate that in a little more elegant way, we would say she looked on the just person steadfastly. You can kind of translate it so that it has an adverbial meaning. And finally, I recorded the subsequent action. She ordains a good fate for them. So this is the activity that follows the verb. In populating the database, to use this example of Iggy Bar, this is how our um, table would look. So you have your verb form, Iggy Zid Munshi Bar, the prefix, which is Mu, the infix, which is a terminative infix, the extension on the noun was Zid, the subject is Anana, subject type is goddess, and it goes on and on and on. This is just to give you an example of what it would look like when you actually open up your database table and you're plunking all of this information into it. So for each record, you're listing all of this um, information and the same information for every vocabulary instances that you collect. Once the database is fully populated, the records can be filtered according to their attributes and then reports can be created that contain these filtered sets of records. Um, so what I mean by that is, if I have a complete table full of different vocabulary instances, I can look up only vocabulary that has the prefix mu. Or maybe I'll look up vocabulary that has the prefix mu and also has the terminative infix. How does that compare to vocabulary that has the prefix mu but has the locative infix instead? So you can use the database to retrieve um, information that has these common attributes. If you're using spreadsheets to manage your data, it's also possible to filter data in um, programs like Excel. So moving on to data analysis, um, by analyzing the, rec the results of this type of filtering, you can detect patterns in your data. Um, at, the very, uh, at a very simple level, um, you can start with something like your incidence of vision verbs. There are um, five verbs with more than 60 instances, five vision verbs with more than 60 instances in the Sumerian literary corpus. The other 24 verbs of vision account for less than 120 instances. Uh, so some of those occur in very small numbers. Um, the top five verbs here are igibar, meaning to look, igidu, meaning to see, igingal, meaning to focus on, Iggy um, il, meaning to lift the eye, and usix dug for, which means to regard or to admire. So Iggy bar and Iggy do, you can see, account for almost half of all instances of vision verbs in the literary corpus. They're the two most basic verbs of vision, the two most fundamental ways that you can express um, visual action. Now, evidence that um, I compiled in the database was helpful for clarifying the meanings of the verbs as they're used in the literary corpus. 
Um, to begin with, the grammatical and contextual evidence revealed a basic distinction between sight on the one hand and gaze on the other. So sight characterizes vision as a movement inward, um, an external, and this is very much like how we think of vision scientifically. You have an external object um, that makes an impression and then creates an image in the observer's mind. So it's an inward moving process of visual perception. Gaze, on the other hand, is an outward moving process. It's the orientation of the eyes towards an object. And we have verbs that function this way as well. So you look at something, you stare at something. That's really talking about where your eyes are looking. The two aren't mutually exclusive. Obviously, you're looking at something, you're also seeing it. But it's a question of which um, aspect of vision they emphasize. So one emphasizes perception, and the other emphasizes action. It had already been proposed um, that Iggy do, eight, was Sumerian's fundamental verb of sight, and Iggy bar was its fundamental verb of gaze. So the reason that both of them occur, and in similar numbers, is because one of them means visual perception, and one of them means visual action. And the contextual evidence from the database that I looked at um, supported this distinction. So that Iggy do eight as a verb of sight was evident from its use to describe the experience of dreaming. Um, in Gudea Cylinder A, we have this passage. On that day, it was Gudea who saw a nocturnal vision concerning his master, the Lord Ningirsu. Dreams and visions are purely perceptive. You can't look at a dream. It's not a, an object that exists in the world. They can be seen insofar as they're a type of sensory phenomena that's just arising from your brain activity, but they don't have a tangible presence towards which you can direct your eyes. Um, the fact that Iggy Do 8 is um, a type of visual perception is also suggested by the fact that the word for blindness or blind person is Iggy Nu Do 8. Nu is a negation. So this means someone who cannot see. This is another way that we can um, understand Iggy Do 8 as a verb of perception. Contextual evidence from the literary corpus also supported the interpretation that Iggy Bar, on the other hand, denoted gaze. So for example, Iggy Bar occurs in parallel formulations with descriptions of physical movements like raising the head. And these make the most sense if we think of Iggy Bar as also relating to movement, in this case, the movement of the eyes. And as an example, may she look upon me with her eye of life, may she lift her radiant brow to me. So in this case, it seems to be um, paralleling two different types of physical movement. One is movement with the eye and one is movement with the brow or the face. Contextual evidence compiled in the database can help us identify um, differences in meaning between other verbs whose precise definitions have been less clear. So there was already um, a general understanding that these were the meanings of Iggy Duet and Iggy Bar, but the verbs Iggy Ngal Tu, Iggy Gar, and Iggy Iltu were all defined as to look at. So even though they're being used in, in various contexts, they are just getting one um, definition in the Pennsylvania Sumerian Dictionary or the electronic Pennsylvanian, um, Pennsylvania Sumerian Dictionary. So the question is, what are the nuances between these verbs? They all mean something to do with looking, but what are the connotations that differ from one verb to another? Here are some, ex some examples of where they occur. Nungal, this is a goddess, looks at judgments and decisions. She knows true from false. This is using the verb igingal to. The second instance uses the verb igingar, and don't worry too much about ibi, it's an alternate way to write igi. Um, they lament that the god Enlil looked away from it and towards a foreign land. The last example uses igi il to. When he looks heavenward at sin, who's also a god, he wept to him as if to his father who begot him. So these are three examples of three verbs being used in very different contexts, um, but they're all being defined as look at if we use the traditional understanding of these verbs. However, by looking at these contexts in combination with the many other contexts that I collected from the literary corpus, we can come up with more precise definitions. 
So Nungal supervises judgments and decisions. Um, the verb Iggy Gal Tu seems to have a higher level of intensity. It seems to be talking about vision where someone is really scrutinizing or paying close attention to something. The second example, Iggy Gar, they lament that Enlil set his eye away from it and towards a foreign land. Iggy Gar seems to differ in terms of intention. So it seems to have to do with setting a goal having an object that you're intending to do something with. So we might prefer to define that instead of look at, which doesn't have those more complicated um, connotations, as setting your eye on something as a goal. And in the third example, Iggy Il too, that seems to mean look upward. So in this instance, we have someone who's looking up to the heavens, but we have other instances where people are looking up to the parapets, so that would be um, on top of a fortification, or a fish in a pond looking up at a bird. So again, if you're, uh, until you look at all of these instances in their context, it's difficult to um, suss out these nuances, but instead of just defining them generally as to look at, once we've compared their context, we can define them more specifically. Iggy and Galtu, to focus on something or to look at something fixedly. Iggy and Gar, to set your sights on like a goal. And Iggy Il too, to lift the eye, to look upward, to look over a vista or to survey something. Now, contextual evidence also demonstrates that dimensional infixes have semantic consequences for vision verbs. So earlier, I was saying that we had the terminative infix in our form of Iggy Bar. That's traditionally been understood as just a simple indicator of direction. So you're looking towards something. That's what the terminative means. But it turns out when you look closely at um, the instances of these verbs in the corpus, you compare the large number of um, instances that occur in the literary corpus, you actually get different meanings for the verb depending on what dimensional infix occurs with it. So when Iggy Bar occurs without an infix, it seems to mean very generally just to look at something with no particular connotations. When it occurs with the locative infix, it appears to mean to look around, to survey, to look over something or to examine it. And when it appears with the terminative infix, it means to gaze upon. So to look intently at something in a specific way. And the way you're looking at it is usually defined by an extension of the nominal element Iggy. So like we saw before, steadfastly. I'm looking at something steadfastly. Dimensional infixes also have semantic con um, consequences for other vision verbs. So for instance, for Iggy Gal Tu, if it doesn't have an infix, it means to focus on something for the purposes of understanding it better. If it occurs with the locative infix, it means to focus on something with care. Um, so to pay attention to something, to take care of it. And if it occurs with the terminative infix, it means to focus on someone with respect, like your social superior, or to focus on something with particular interest. Um, so this was something that only came out of looking at a very large number of instances of these verbs. Traditionally, the understanding of these infixes is that they mean only direction. But in fact, when we look at how these verbs are used, um, they have semantic consequences for vision verbs, which only came out of looking at and correlating a large number of instances um, together. So, if we look at more uh, detailed statistical analyses of these verbal instances, and if you're using a database to manage your data, it's at this stage that you may want to switch over to a spreadsheet program, which is targeted more towards statistical analysis. Um, you can use your database to obtain the numbers and then your spreadsheet to crunch the numbers to produce graphs based on them and so forth. The usage of vision verbs in Sumerian literature actually varies significantly in accordance with the identity of the verb's subject. Um, we get a, a real subject differentiated usage. So you can see um, in this chart, Igibar occurs in much, much larger numbers with divine subjects um, than with human subjects. And the reverse is true for Igidu8. So it seems like human beings are much more likely to see, to perceive, Iggy do eight, and gods are much more likely to look at something, to gaze upon something. 
Um, you also see the difference in verbs like igi il tu. Gods are more likely to look up at something. And with usik stug for, which means to admire something or to regard something, human beings are much more likely to do that than gods are. Um, you'll, um, I will. I want to look a little bit more closely at igi duet and igi bar in particular. Um, so you'll see that I broke different types of beings down into a number of different categories, not just gods and humans, but also deified kings, undeified kings, um, and other, which includes animals. There aren't very many instances of those, but they are out there. Um, and the reason I considered kings separately from other types of beings is because I wanted to account for the possibility that vision of kings in Sumerian literature might be more similar to the vision of the gods than to the vision of other human beings. So a fundamental function of kings in Mesopotamia was to mediate between the divine and human realms. And in the literary sources, this liminal boundary status sometimes gives way to more direct identifications between kings and gods. And I wanted to make sure not to miss that if that occurred in the way that the vision verbs are being used as well. So, Human beings are more than three times as likely to appear as the subjects of Igidu 8 as they are to appear as the subjects of Igibar. So you can see in the pink there, um, much more common with seeing than it is with gazing. On the other hand, gods occur as the subjects of Igibar almost three times as often as they occur as the subjects of Igidu 8. So that's 117 versus only 40 instances. And when you look at each verb individually, um, and I'll just, let me use this for this. So when you look, when you look at each verb, well, I think it's not very visible. When you look at each verb individually, you'll also see that human beings are m much more likely to see than gods are, and gods are much more likely to gaze than human beings are. So it works both ways. Igibar gazing is closely associated with the gods. And these major discrepancies exist despite only a very small um, difference in the number of total verbs we have, um, total instances of both verbs that we have in the corpus. Now the correspondence between gods and gazing is even more striking when you consider the impact of dimensional infixes on Igibar. So if you look at the frequency of different subject types for infix patterns of Igibar, for igi shibar, with the terminative infix, which seems to mean to gaze upon something with a particular intention, that almost always occurs with divine subjects. And that's compared with the other meanings of igi bar, um, igi ni bar with the locative infix, meaning to survey, and then igi bar with other infixes. So this seems to indicate that igi shibar is a divine action. It's something that's very closely associated with the gods and very little associated um, with human beings and other types of actors. Um, if you go on to analyze specifically instances of Igi Shibar and what their characteristics are, the finding that I made is that of the 80 examples of divine gaze that's expressed by this verb in the literary corpus, the verb is followed by a consequence for its object in 60 instances. So about... Um, that's about 75% of the instances are followed by an obvious consequence for each, for the verb's object. These outcomes fall into several general categories. There are beneficial consequences for the object of the gaze. For instance, advantages related to well-being, and these can be things like life, health, contentment, and abundance. Benefits to a monarch's reign, such as success in battle and enduring kingship, the further exercise of divine faculties for the purpose of benediction. So this is something like the goddess looks on the king and she ordains a favorable fate for him. She listens to his prayers. She takes some other type of action that is to his benefit. It's sometimes followed between, with sexual interactions between the god who is gazing and the object of the gaze. This occurs in a number of myths. So a, a god gazes on someone and then they have intercourse. There can also be activities undertaken by the object of the gaze. So the king might say, the god looked upon me, and then I built their temple. 
So sometimes that's the action that follows the God's gaze. And finally, in a small number of instances, there can be adverse consequences. So the God um, looks on you, and particularly if the looking is described in a negative way, the God looks on you angrily, and then bad things happen to you. So this, these effects of the divine gaze became evident by pairing um, the instances down using the database format. If we're looking just at Igibar, with the terminative infix, with divine subjects, we're able to see that, oh, those instances almost always have consequences that you don't get if you're looking at Igibar with the locative infix and a divine subject, or Igibar with the terminative infix and a human subject. Um, so this is one way that by isolating all those instances, you're able to get um, new information out of the corpus. Now, in this case, you can ask, is the relationship um, between the divine gaze that's expressed by Iggy Shibar and a change in circumstance for the object of the verb um, coincidence, or is there actually a cause there? Is the God actually making something happen? Um, it's meaningful that the object of the verb only undergoes a change after the act of vision. So if we were to see the change taking place before the act of vision, we might think, well, maybe the change happened and that attracted the God's attention. But it always occurs after um, the vision verb, which suggests that the vision verb either is causing it itself or is an expression of the God's ability to cause um, changes in human lives and to have an impact on human beings. The capacity to gaze is also constrained by status, and this is another interesting um, feature that emerged from this research. So instances of Iggy Shibar in the Sumerian literary corpus conform to a strict pattern. Um, both gods and goddesses can gaze on human beings, including kings, and upon inanimate objects. Male gods gaze on goddesses, but only Enlil, the king of the gods, and in one case, um, Enlil together with the god An, who's um, the supreme ruler of heaven, also a sort of leader amongst the gods, gaze upon other gods. Gods at the same level of status can't gaze on each other. Where human kings and non-royal human beings occur as the subjects of the gaze, the object of the verb is always inanimate. So you never get a human being gazing on another human being or human beings gazing on the gods. So this type of influential gaze in Sumerian literature operates according to the following hierarchical order. You have Enlil, the king of the gods, who can gaze on male gods. Male gods can gaze on goddesses. Goddesses can gaze on kings and human beings. And kings and, hu and other human beings can gaze on inanimate objects. But no one lower on this status can gaze back up at the people um, above them on this hierarchy. And there's actually a Sumerian text, Enlil in the Acor, that makes a reference to these types of status restrictions on the gaze and praises Enlil by saying, Musa dingir igi nubaridam, there is no god who can look at your face. So this seems to be suggesting that only you have the power to look at other gods. No god has the power to look at you. Um, on this scheme, status seems to be a matter not merely of being invested with authority, but actually having power that are superior to powers that are superior to those who are beneath you. Um, so Enlil's rulership is demonstrated not only by his just social privilege over the other gods, but actually he has superior divine abilities. And that is reflected in the way that the vision verbs are used um, in the literary texts. Interestingly, because we can see that this gaze verb operates according to a hierarchical model, uh, relegates goddesses to a secondary status relative to male gods, which was another interesting finding. And this is true even for Inanna, who's an extremely um, powerful goddess. Um, but she too seems to have this inferior status when it comes to gods being able to act on one another. There's only one instance in the literature where she looks on another god, but he is um, her consort, Dumuzi, who's somewhere between divine and human. He is not as much a god as the other gods, and that may be why an exception is made there. So the work had this interesting um, uh, finding in terms of status of divine beings as well. 
So using this database methodology to look at a very large number of instances enable new discoveries in Sumerian grammar, semantics, and usage, and specifically by looking at the subject-specific usage of the verbs, um, this was uh, this suggested a theological system in which deities are essentially active, they're emanating powers outward um, to affect the material world, like their gaze, which is able to affect the lives of human beings, while humans, in contrast, are fundamentally receptive. They're passive perceivers of uh, physical stimuli and receivers of divine influence. Um, this method that I'm using in my work uh, is also adaptable to other ancient languages. It can be used for analyzing individual words, for analyzing word fields, groups of related words. It can be used for diachronic analysis because if you're tagging different periods, you can track the development of vocabulary instances over time. There are also a number of possibilities for future work and specifically the more um, corpora go up online, um, the more possibilities there will be for automating the process of database population. So I, autom I um, populated my databases by hand by looking up vocabulary instances and putting them all into the database myself and tracking the prefixes and infixes and context, etc. But there is the possibility um, to automate that and have that done um, mechanically the more sophisticated the corpora that are um, posted online become. So I think that this type of database analysis um, provides good tools for analyzing um, language and in the case of mysterious and less known languages like Sumerian can reveal a number of features that just can't be seen when you're looking at smaller data sets using traditional methodology. So that's kind of a broad overview, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about it.